braving the cold to come all the way here. I came all the way from Boston in the cold. It was really cold. Um, and I'd like to start by saying that I'm, this is going to be an interpretive talk about the paper, which means that I will talk about the paper, but the paper was so long ago that a lot has happened since then. So I will talk about some work that has been done. Uh, the work happened to be work that I did, so I know it. <laughs> so I'm not cheating or anything, I promise. Um, and also I want to say this is kind of a feel-good talk, so there are some scary words here like axiomatic and computer, but <laughs> it's going to be okay. I'm not going to use those words very much. All right, I'll tell you what they mean. One of them. Um, so let's start by talking about why we want to prove software correct, right? So, I mean, back in oh. right? So, um, the funny thing is, I was giving a talk about this once, and I put this, and I pretended I didn't know what happened, but I put that there, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when you're making some slides you haven't saved yet, and you're like, oh, crap, I have to give a talk in an hour, but I'm not going to have any talk. And then, you know, it says, do you wish to debug? And you say, I don't know how to debug this. So, a side story is that my advisor one time was in a sim similar situation where he was making some slides, for a class all morning, he didn't save, I don't know what his deal is, and then he was like, I have no choice, I have to debug. <laughs> he managed to step his program out of an infinite loop. He was just like, just like kept on stepping it, and he's like, okay, it's infinite looping, I'm just going to put it outside of the loop, and it worked. So like, if, if it happens to you, oh shoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, cool. That, we, uh, we can't prevent things like that, but, you know. Um, so, yeah, that was like a whole line of research after that, but, you know. Yeah, so um, when bugs happen, uh, not only does your talk get delayed, but, you know, you could lose all of your data, maybe years' worth of data, right? But the good thing is now we have the cloud, so that can back things up. But the bad thing is the cloud can leak all of our data now because there's just another source of bugs, right? And so, um, if you were alive last year, um, <laughs> you, um, you heard of Heartbleed, which was the result of what, like a memory bounds check. Uh, someone didn't check some memory. This could have been prevented if only they had some axioms and some computers. <laughs> so, um, so it's not just our data that is in danger, but also our lives. So, who's heard of this Toyota acceleration bug? Yeah, so like probably more of us should have heard of this because um, there was a bug in Toyota cars that caused them to randomly accelerate, which is very dangerous. If you've ridden in a car, you should know this. Um, and so, yeah, so Toyota is putting a lot of effort actually into proving software programs to be correct because, you know, more and more of cars are running on uh, software, and if it's not correct, you can die. Um, and also, there's like other famous bugs, like one time this Korea error plane crashed because there was some case they didn't consider where um, it was hydroplaning, but they're like, well, if your wheels aren't moving, then you can't stop because um, you're in the air. Um, and so then the plane crashed. So, you know, the whole, yeah, so software bugs can really lead to the apocalypse and we should be really worried, except for there's the cheaper. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the talk. Just go. Um, so yeah, we can take comfort or not in the fact that software is being produced in very uh, calm environments like this, where um, you know, the social network and anecdotal evidence and personal experience tell us that people tend to drink a lot of alcohol when uh, producing software programs, and um, we should really trust their software for this reason. Um, and so, I mean, this is really the equivalent of uh, trusting a guy who looks like this to build our bridges, right? Um, which is not the best idea, but a good thing there's such a thing as inspection for bridges, right? We can load test our bridges, we can measure the bridge to make sure it's not crooked, to make sure it's not going to fall down, right? Um, but the thing is, what's the equivalent for software, right? So how, how do we make sure our software isn't going to kill us? And so this is uh, an interactive part of the talk where we can, we can think about this. Um, having read the paper, we can like, withhold from that part. But how do, how do other people make sure software is correct? Write a spec. You can write a spec, yeah. Test. A lot of details. Testing, a lot of testing, right? Deploy to production and see what breaks. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really trust that method. Yeah, yeah they're, um, they're hiring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to for you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there's testing, right? Which is kind of like Reddit Gosling saying, 
I looked in the mirror five times, and every time I look good, so therefore I must look good, everything is good, right? Um, so the problem when you're doing this with a situation outside of Ryan Gosling is that <laughs> there are more inputs to the system than just Ryan Gosling who always looks good. And so like in testing, normally what happens is like you have this hypothesis, like my program is correct and here are the reasons why, right? You have like these waves, you want to test the hypothesis, like, okay, like there are these inputs, there are those inputs, and there are those inputs, right? But usually you have this like really big input space and your program is really big and complicated and it's pretty hard to cover all the possible spaces. And so real life is more complicated than Ryan Gosling in conclusion. Um, but so another approach we can take is logical reasoning where you have this set of facts that you build up about what you assume to be true over uh, the entire world. Um, and you deduce that, you know, if uh, certain facts hold, then you can prove other facts, and if those facts hold, then, you know, no matter what inputs happen in your program, assuming you model the program correctly, then, um, you know, that's equivalent to testing, like, all possible inputs in your program, right? So, back to the Ryan Gosling case, it's like Ryan Gosling saying, I'm wearing a suit, Ryan Gosling looks good in suit, therefore, I must look good, right? And this is kind of like those geometry proofs. This is a very small picture of that to remind you that um, you might have done in geometry class where you like draw a triangle, you draw some lines on the triangle, and then you write some numbers, and then you get an A. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so in this talk, we'll talk about a logical reasoning-based approach to making sure that your program works all the time, and not just in some cases. And so I'm. Um, the ingredients of this logical approach are this axioms. The axioms are uh, part of what word that we saw? That was kind of scary. Axiomatic. Yeah. Um, so axioms are the set of facts that we have to work with. And um, what we want to do is we want to build theorems out of those axioms. And how we build the theorems is out based on deduction rules. And so axioms are kind of like Legos. Um, we're allowed to put Legos together as long as you know the holes go into the things, or the things go into the holes. Um, <coughs> And then, like, anything we can build, um, that's, well, I guess, like, the holes going into the things are, you know, that, those are our deduction rules, and then the things we build out of our axioms are theorems, and then those can, in turn, be, you know, use the same as axioms to be involved in more deduction rules, and then we can prove bigger and bigger things, right? Cool. So everyone is still here. Um, all right, so then um, we can start by talking about some rules of deductive logic, just to give you a feel for like, how this works. And so the, de the detachment rule uh, says that if P implies Q uh, and P are true, so everything above the line is uh, things that we assume to be true, and the thing below the line is our conclusions. So if we have P implies Q and P, then uh, Q is true. So this is a slightly different syntax than I've seen in the paper. So in the paper, you have these like uh, turn style things, like a line and a dash. So instead, we're using these lines, because that's the modern way of doing it. Um, so bringing this back to our running example, we have, um, if you are Ryan Gosling, we know that this, this implication is true, that if you are Ryan Gosling, then you look good. We established that. So if you are Ryan Gosling, what happens? Yeah. Guys, you're, you're doing really great at logic. Um, all right, so now let's look at how we chain these implications together, right? So um, if you have Q, P implies Q, and Q implies R, and P is true, then uh, R follows from that, right? So that's kind of like saying, um, if you are Ryan Gosling, then you have great hair. All people with great hair look good. And so if you are Ryan Gosling, you look good. <laughs> so are other questions, conclusions so far? <laughs> <laughs> really just the tribute to Ryan Gosling. Um, all right, so now uh, final one we have is contrapositive. So if we have P implies Q and we have not Q, then what follows is not P. And so to illustrate this point, we bring back our friend. Um, actually, we never saw him before. He's not our friend. If you are Ryan Gosling, you look good. So if you don't look good, you must not be Ryan Gosling, right? And so the note here is that if you're not Ryan Gosling, you could look good or you could look bad, but I mean, does anyone really care? <laughs> and so, all right, we have some deductive logic rules. Now we can move on. So does everyone understand so far? Are there questions so far? 
Yes. Can we see another picture of Ryan Gosling? Yeah. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe if you think I am. Um, all right, so we have, um, we have this nice basis for reasoning about things, right? But what about programs, right? So programs are really complicated. There are lots of parts to them. And um, it's not always easy to characterize them. And so now we know how to reason, but how do we reason about programs, right? And so reasoning about programs was uh, Hor's contribution. Well, so like, it's questionable. It's not questionable, <laughs> but, um, so, well, okay. There are many people who contributed to reasoning about programs, but Hor was the best writer out of all of them, and so his paper gets cited the most. And so, let this be a lesson to the world. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the, the contribution of this paper and everything else I'll be talking about. Um, and so there was some previous work by um, Perlman and someone whose name starts with a G, Guinness, and Floyd on characterizing program state, right? And so there are many ways you can characterize the state of a program. And uh, usually, like, you know, you characterize the part of program state that matters to you. And here are some examples of valid ways you can describe program state, right? So I can say that my variable x is equal to 3. That's a description of my program state, right? I can say y is greater than x. If x is not equal to 0, then y plus b equals w. This could be true. I don't know. Um, uh, I can say s is the summation of all the things, uh, all the elements i and something a, maybe an array. And I can say something, this is a for all. I can say for all i um, from 1 to n, you know, the ith element of a, probably an array, is greater than the previous element of the array. And also I can just say true. Yeah, true is a, a true thing about my program state. Um, and so, so we have all this, and people were sort of um, characterizing programs in ways like this. Floyd had a paper on flowcharts before this. And the big contribution that Hoare's paper did was it introduced this thing called the Hoare triple for characterizing programs. So what the Hoare triple says is that you have this program, so it's a contract about um, what it means for your program to be correct, right? So in a Hoare triple, you have a precondition, which is what needs to be satisfied in order for uh, the, everything else to be true. You have your program, which is the program, and then you have a postcondition, which is what is true if your precondition is satisfied and the program ran, right? So um, in order for the whole thing to be satisfied, two things have to be true, right? So the precondition has to hold, and also your program has to terminate. And so, so, so you'll see, yeah, these, these two things are really big assumptions. But as long as those two things hold, then the post condition is true. And so this is called partial correctness because um, there's, so there's, there's a theorem that you can't tell if a program is going to terminate. And um, you know, if your program doesn't terminate, then you can have whatever post condition you want. And so now we, we will look at some example Hoare triples, and these things will come into account, right, or come into play. So uh, the first thing is, well, if you have true starting with this uh, assignment of x to 5, uh, then afterwards x equals 5 holds, right? And so here we have a program that assigns x to x plus 3. And so if x is equal to y before this program, then x is equal to y plus 3 after the program, right? So now we have a program that multiplies x by 2. If x is greater than 0 before the program, then x is greater than negative 2 after the program, right? Um, and so then this one, uh, the next one is also similar, right? We have like if x is less than 0, then we take negative x. We're taking the absolute value. So if x is equal to some a, x is equal to the absolute value of a after the program. The next one is interesting. So uh, this one. I don't know if this laser pointer works, but this uh, x equals 3. Um, false is true beforehand, and x equals 8 is true after. So what's going on there? Well, you can't have a false precondition. Right, never. right, exactly. So the false precondition never holds, so we can just put whatever we want for the post condition, and it's still about a valid Hoare triple, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next case is also interesting. So what's going on there? Right, so we have this while true, do x equals x plus 1, right? So we're essentially incrementing the variable x forever. Um, so it never terminates, so that's why we can just say false for our post condition. We can say anything because the program never terminates. Right? So in general, you're not going to know if it terminates or not, right? You know, yeah. 
Right, right. But um, but for for this program, well, yeah. Can but <laughs> yeah. Can you make it undefined there? Pause. You can put anything you want after this non-terminating program. Yeah, and I, the lower triple, the contract is only that if the precondition holds and the the program terminates, right? So if those two things don't hold, then whatever post condition you want could be there. So Ryan Gosling could be the post condition. Ryan Gosling could be the post condition. What is of Ryan Gosling being the post condition? <laughs> Some programs might not hold, so I don't know that that four triples really valid. It's, it's always valid. So the programs that don't hold anything is valid. Yeah. Uh -huh. So for those That's programs what? especially, Ryan Gosling can really do the free proposal. What program changes Ryan Gosling? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right. There's some problems here, guys. This is just to illustrate some point. <laughs> Actually, no, don't tell me. Uh, <laughs> anyone. Um, let's just keep going. So, um, so the assignment rule from the paper, which all of you read, um, we have uh, x equals x plus 1, and we want to say x is less than or equal to n after, right? And so if you'll recall from the paper, uh, we have this axiom schema. So what it means to be an axiom schema is that it's not an axiom. It's something that tells you how to make axioms. So it's telling us how to make this axiom. Um, and so it says that if x is a variable identifier, f is an expression, and p0 is obtained from p by substituting f for all occurrences of x, right? So um, what should go in the question mark box? x plus 1 less than equal to n. Exactly. Yeah. Good work, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, to illustrate this point with our running example, um, so we have a... Uh, x equals x plus suit, and then we get Ryan Gosling in a suit after. So what should go before? Ryan Gosling. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we don't know anything about Megan Ryan Gosling. Do we have any deduction rules for that yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, do, what goes in the Well, yeah, so we have x plus two equals Ryan Gosling before, before I think. Um, so, right, so that's assignment. We have assignment rule so far. Are there any questions about assignment? Okay, cool, yeah, Ryan Gosling makes everything clear. Um, um, I, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Not a funny question. <laughs> um, we, we were talking about four triples, and then we started talking about schemas for axioms. Right. Uh, it, it is, is essentially a four triple an axiom? Is that um, one way of thinking about it? Yeah, uh, so, okay. Sorry, I forgot to say that part because I got distracted by um, Ryan Gosling. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there are really two contributions of this paper. Uh, one is this way of characterizing programs, and so, like, characterizing the specifications for what it means for a program to be correct, right? And then once we have that characterization, we need a way to prove that characterization, right? And so we need a way for a computer to automatically go through, and, or a computer plus a human or some combination of something, to go through and deduce theorems from the axioms, right? And so what the assignment rule schema and all these other rules do is they're providing a way to go from axioms to theorems. And so, right, yeah. Um, all right, so, um, so now, uh, usually programs are made up of multiple 
functions, right? So the composition rule tells us what to do if we have multiple things and we want to chain them together, right? So if we have a precondition P, a program Q1, a postcondition R1, and then another program Q2 with precondition R1 and postcondition R, then we can say that uh, if we have precondition Q, uh, P, we can chain Q1 and Q2 together and we get the postcondition R, right? Um, and so some examples of this are um, if we have a program that increments x by 1 and we have x is greater than 1 before the program and x is greater than 2 after the program, and then we have another program where that does the same thing except we know x is greater than 2 before the program and greater than 3 after the program, we can chain them together and know that x is greater than 1 before we run everything and it's greater than 3 after the whole thing. Right? And so this is really useful because like you can, uh, an, an automated prover can go through and <coughs> chain your different functions together once you've proven little properties about them. So if Ryan Gosling's right two suit, he's just as good looking as those two right one suit? Like, so if you have some rules for that, yeah. Um, right, so uh, now there's a thing that we want to do, which is um, we have the same first program, and we're taking the uh, negative x for the second program, and we have the precondition that if x is greater than 0 before we run this, then x is going to be less than 0 after we run it. Um, and so if we want to chain these two together, what can we say about the post condition based on the rules we have so far? x is less than 0. x is less than negative 2. So someone said not much, and why is that? Because the r1 is not the same. Like right, exactly. Two is not the same. We don't have the same r1. And so with the rules we have already, we actually cannot chain these together based on uh, things we've seen already. But, yeah, so we have a consequence rule which tells us how to use implication to chain things together, right? So if you have uh, P, uh, P is a precondition for a program Q and R is a postcondition and R implies S, you can replace uh, R with S and you can replace S with P if S implies P as the precondition. And so now that we have the consequence rule, we can go through and we can say, well, x is greater than 2 implies x is greater than 0. And so now we can say x is less than 0. And so the question you asked before, like why are we defining all these rules? Well, we're defining them so someone can go through and uh, someone or some machine can go through and methodically <coughs> deduce the things we want to prove based on the axioms we have about what's true. So are there questions at this point? I know you guys all have a question. One is Ryan Gosling coming back. So he's coming back. Um, and so uh, so if you'll recall, we had uh, this rule, which is you know we assigned Ryan Gosling to Ryan Gosling plus a suit, and we got him in a suit. And what was our precondition? And some people are wondering about naked Ryan Gosling, right? So, so what would it take to um, to say that Ryan Gosling was not wearing anything before we assigned him to a suit? This. But that's a half naked. Yes. <laughs> um, so I didn't know what the like rules were for uh, decency of the talk, so I didn't want to take any risks, you know? Um, Only if he was wearing an X plus half a suit. Well, this is like kind of half a suit, you know? Um, we got the same naked Ryan Gosling plus suit. There's Ryan Gosling in a suit, right? That's yeah, exactly. So, so this guy here says you would have to say that, um, you know, if uh, if X plus suit equals Ryan Gosling, then X had to equal uh, Ryan Gosling without a suit to begin with. And so, if we if we had this rule, right, this allows us to say Ryan Gosling was not wearing anything before, which is what everyone wants. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> 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 should, it be, should it be the other way around? That's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, that, I think that's the middle line thinking. needs to be reversed to be. Uh, uh, oh, you're right, actually. Good, good. That was, uh, I put that there to. to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. This actually should be switched around. But, um, yeah, so we will do that next time. It's a bug in the slides. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a slide bug. Yeah, didn't verify them. Um, cool. So, um, so we also have iteration now. Um, so this rule is a little bit complicated. You don't really have to understand it, but I put a little key there to help you understand it if you do. 
Um, so we have while B do S. Um, so that's what the while loops look like back in the day of Horace Petra. Um, and so if you know that P is true before um, and P is true after, the extra thing that happens is uh, not P is also true after. So you have um, P is true and then B is the precondition for, for going into the loop and then P is the postcondition for the loop. Um, you can have this, uh, this property when you come out. Yes? Is this assuming side effect free operation? Presumably the while loop could change P, right? So, so the thing is, that's a really good question. Um, so P is what's called the loop invariant. Okay. And so it is something that is true even if side effects happen inside the loop. Okay. And so um, it's actually very hard to find this P. So I'll show some examples of using the iteration rule and then I'll talk about a little bit about how hard it is to find that P. But, um, but yeah, so you do have to find a P that holds throughout the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I love to use the word variant because they use that a lot to keep the loop. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, right, and so, so here's just some basic examples of uh, using uh, using the iteration rule. So we have while x is less than 10, do uh, x equals x plus one. So this is just really simple. True is true before the loop iterates and true is true after the loop, loop iterates. And then the extra property we get is less, uh, x is now greater than or equal to 10 after the loop, right? Um, you can have a slightly more interesting property that x is greater than zero. So like if we know that is true before the loop iterates, we can also show that that is true after the loop iterates. Um, and so with loops, there's a whole interesting body of work that has happened after this paper, which is finding, uh, so there, there are these notions of uh, weakest precondition. So what is the weakest statement that needs to hold before, um, before your, your program happens in order for everything else to hold? And uh, there's the notion of strongest postcondition. So what is the strongest thing you can say about after the program executes? And then there's this concept of a loop invariant. So an invariant is something that is true no matter if all the other state changes. And so, so your question is actually a very good one because so there's a, there's a notion that the state has to change because if the state's not changing, then an invariant doesn't really right. do very much, right? So the invariant is what stays the same if all the other state changes. And um, there's a whole body of work on finding loop invariants. And um, so actually, Finding, um, finding, there's a thing called the strongest loop invariant, which is the strongest possible P that holds, and that is undecidable. So uh, does someone want to tell me what it means for something to be undecidable? It's really hard. It's really hard. Um, what's that? Right, so you can't, you you can't assign an algorithm for figuring out what it means, right? And so, um, so what it means for something to be undecidable is you can write a procedure to compute it, but you have no guarantee that that will ever finish. And so some examples of things that are undecidable are determining whether a program ever terminates. Um, and there are a lot of other problems that are undecidable, and people often prove that you know, doing this is equivalent to determining whether a program terminates. So yeah, so finding the strongest loop invariant in many domains, most domains, is equivalent to deciding whether a program terminates. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't find loop invariants. It just means that um, if we try to find them, the procedure to find them might infinite loop. It might give us a loop invariant, but it's not the strongest. So in practice, there are tools that will find these loop invariants, but we just don't have guarantees that they will terminate or give us the best one. But can you still prove algorithmic correctness without having the strongest loop invariant? Um, yeah, right. You, you, can still, you can still prove what you have, but um, you just, so, so often, if you don't have the strongest one, you won't be able to prove things that you know are true. Um, so yeah, so the problem with all these proof tools is that um, often you'll know something is true and that you should be able to prove it, but there's no uh, automated algorithm that, that can prove it to you because of this undecidability. Um, and, uh, but if you can prove it, then it's definitely true. Yeah, yes? I have undecidabilities for all possible programs. You can still find <laughs> programs that hold. Right. But undecidability for all possible. You can't find an algorithm that works for all possible algorithms. Right, right. Then there are domains like like certain data structures right. for which it is decidable. So does that mean that you can like just assert that to be an axiom and like put it sort of like as a precondition if you know it's true but you can't prove it? Like um. So if you know it's true but you can't prove it, you could axiomatize it, but that's really dangerous. <laughs> so when you're <laughs> True. Right, right, because like, so when you're trying to prove something, especially in an automated way, you really want this automated assurance that what you thought was true is, um, 
we is in yeah, fact you want to sandbox it or something. Yeah, it is in fact deducible from like the axioms, right? So you can axiomatize the hard parts, but then you that that goes into your trusted space, and you really want to minimize that as much as possible. And in general, axiomatizing what you can prove is too good for to go to like a proof test. Yeah. So like yeah, you can. So like I guess like the the trap doors, you can just axiomatize things, but um, then you don't know. What it is. Then it's just a postulate. Yeah. All right. Cool. So um. So uh. So here's an example of characterizing programs are uh, in horror logic in real life. And so this is a program that uh. What does this program do? I'll give you guys a second to read it. Exactly. Yeah. So this is um. It's just called sum. So you can look at it that way, or you can see that you have this sum variable that's being assigned to zero, you have this integer i that's your uh, loop variable, and then while i is less than low length, um, which uh, I got this slide from somewhere else and there's a typo there. <laughs> but uh, I think that's supposed to be len. Uh, and uh, see, I put that there in case this happens. Um, but uh, it's interesting to perpetuate. Yeah, yeah, this is how, this is how bugs perpetuate, yeah. But, um, so we're going through and we're digging on the elements of the array and then we're summing over them and we're returning the sum, right? And so in uh, modern automated tools, this is an example of something you can do. So you can say you require the, le the length of the array to be greater than or equal to zero and the actual array length to be equal to len which you're passing in. And then you can say this ensures that the result is the sum over the elements of the array. Yeah. So this is a very hand wavy sort of. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But but yeah. So this is really just to give you an idea of uh, these are the sorts of things you can write. <laughs> Maybe we should stop propagating the slide. <laughs> but, um, but this is a. Uh, Don't send it to Toyota. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they might just put it into their cars directly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so so there are actually automated tools that will um, that will check this for you. So there's this tool called Boogie, and so this is this is cool because this is a terminal that you can uh, just pull up in your browser, and you can make programs with preconditions and postconditions and check them uh, in the browser. Or you know, if you download the tool, you can do that too. But um, but yeah, so the cool thing about Boogie is that it's fully automated. So you write preconditions and postconditions, and you have to say some other things, like what variables your function is modifying. But it's essentially like Pascal or a simple imperative language with preconditions and postconditions that it verifies automatically. Um, and so there are parts of Boogie that are undecidable. So what does that mean? Cannot be computed. Yeah, so there are parts of Boogie where you just like try to verify something, and it just never stops. In that case, you just control C that. <laughs> and um, you try to put some extra conditions and you hope it works. Um, so this is how dealing with undecidability works in the real world. And so, um, so I'm bringing up Boogie because I use it to verify the type uh, safety of an operating system a few years ago. So this is a project I worked on. Um, and so the idea is operating systems for a long time were the holy grail of verification. Right. So um, operating systems are really complex systems, and they also make up the foundation for all the other software. So if you can make sure that certain properties of operating systems hold, then you can make sure the rest of your system is much more correct. Right. Um, and so there was this line of work to build operating systems in type-safe languages. So what does it mean for a language to be type-safe and memory-safe? Uh, if the compiler accepts it, that's a very, very good question. <laughs> So, Rick? Uh, if the compiler accepts it, then you're guaranteed that you won't have any memory corruption and that uh, you don't need to always type your code. Right, right. So if your program type checks, then you have no dangling pointers, no uh, accidental null pointers, and if, some, if it says something is of a type, then it is of the type, right? And so in languages like C, you don't have this because if you have a pointer to something, it could really be a pointer to something else, and this is how a lot of bugs happen, right? Um, and so the direction that this work was trying to take before Verb was people were trying to build operating systems in type-safe, memory-safe languages like C-sharp. 
The idea is if you can build your language in that, you already have that base level of guarantees and you can just prove additional functional correctness on top of that, right? And so most operating systems are built in very low level languages like C and assembly and um, it's really hard because you have to start with verifying memory properties of that if you wanna verify functional properties in addition, right? And so the approach we took was, well, um, oh, wait, before I get to that, I need to say, so with the C-sharp operating systems, there was uh, a problem because there are parts of operating systems that need to be low level. Do people know? Yeah. What parts? Uh, yeah, the page tables. Interrupts. Interrupts, yeah, like anything having to do with like hardware and memory, right? <laughs> like you can't really write your operating system in C-sharp because there's just all of these calls that are unsafe to low level code, right, that um, subvert all your guarantees. Because when you live in C-sharp, the guarantee is, well, if everything is written in C-sharp, then we have all these nice guarantees. But once we're outside of that, once we call out, we could subvert all of our guarantees and mess up all of our memory, right? Um, and so the approach we took with Verb was we verified a very low level, small sub part of the kernel that we call the nucleus, which is like the page tables, the interrupts, the hardware uh, interface, and uh, the memory stuff to set up the stacks and do context switching and all that. And then we exported an interface to the C-sharp code with this uh, guarantee that the low-level code doesn't mess up the heap, so it doesn't mess up like anything the garbage collector is doing in the allocator. Um, and the high-level code doesn't touch the stack stuff. And there are also some verified garbage <coughs> collectors in there that, um, that the guy I worked with had built before. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how you verify the nucleus? Yeah, yeah, so I'm gonna talk more oh, about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but the cool thing about Verve was we did it using Boogie, which I just showed you on the previous slide. And so, um, so HoraLogic works. Um, so, so essentially we verified the nucleus to satisfy a specification that it uh, could preserve end-to-end -end type safety and memory safety. And um, so a slight motivation for it is, you know, things crashing. So uh, I already told you guys about this, but uh, when I gave a talk on Verb, I had this intro sequence that was uh, PowerPoint crashing and then everything crashed. Um, and I spent like most of my time practicing the timing of that so people thought it was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, um, so in, uh, in Verb, the axioms are the actual assembly instru instructions. So do people remember from the paper what the axioms were? All of them. <laughs> All the axioms in the paper? Well, so, so like, uh, Hor had axiomatized a bunch of stuff about math, right? Mm -hmm. So back then, all programs were just adding numbers to each other or something like that. So he had talked about, you know, addition is commutative, associative, and, like, you have distributive properties and all this other stuff, right? And so those were the building blocks uh, off of which you could do the rest of everything else. Mm -hmm. And so in our system, the building blo blocks were the assembly instructions. And so um, we wrote the rest of the system in terms of assembly instructions that we had axiomatized the specification of. And so in Boogie, um, procedures without bodies are just axioma, axioms. So, um, so you were asking, you know, what happens if you can't prove something? Well, in Boogie, you just don't put a body, and it <laughs> it lets you just pretend it's an axiom. Um, so for us, what we did was, um, for things like load, so load is an assembly instruction that reads a pointer value from memory. And so the return on load is, so load takes a pointer, and the requirement is that the pointer is a valid memory address, and so mem adder is a function that we define somewhere else. Um, also, it has to be a line, so like we're reading from like somewhere where a value actually starts in memory. Um, this load instruction modifies the instruction pointer EIP. And so in the next slide, it might become more clear how we're, we were actually modeling registers if you care about that. And then um, what load ensures is that the uh, value that it is returned is a valid word. So it's like a memory aligned word. And that the value is equivalent to what we're modeling in memory at the pointer location pointer. And so, um, so we have a set of assembly instructions that we are treating as axioms like load, store, add, and a bunch of other stuff. Yes, Bert? Uh, was, was coming up with the guarantees about these assembly instructions like uh, a significant portion of the work? Um, yeah, so, um, so I didn't do that part of the work, <laughs> but <laughs> Chris did, but he spent a lot of time writing a giant specification of what it meant for the high-level code not to touch 
the stacks and the lower level code not to touch the heaps. Yeah, what I did was just write everything else to like conform to that. Yeah, yeah, but it, yeah, it, that that was really tricky. And um, so that is what's that is trusted right now. But um, so after so I had interned with Chris, and Chris had another intern who was supposed to verify certain properties on top of that, but they never finished that. But yeah, but that that specification is really hairy. Cool. Yeah. I think they did finish that. Actually, they, there was a publication earlier this year that was a continuation of Verb and. Oh right. Yeah. yeah no, he did finish that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just put it. Yeah, yeah, with um. Uh, done there, there are a couple. I think there are like three interns. Okay. Yeah, they, there were a lot of people. Okay. Cool. So. Yeah. So so that might have finished. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a post commission set. Um, yeah. Um, so how how this worked was um, so we wrote Gogi that looked like this that called our uh, axiomatized assembly instructions. So this is something that reads from the keyboard and checks the keyboard status. You don't really have to know what happened here. I'm just showing it to give you an idea of how the whole thing was constructed. And then we had a trusted translation of that to actual assembly. And so we wrote uh, Gogi our boogie assembly, um, and we also um, we modeled our registers by declaring global variables that corresponded to our registers that got translated to the actual registers. If you care about that, um, and so yeah, this this translation was trusted, but this whole thing was verified automatically. So the paper talks about go tos being probably terrible, which I believe when I read it. Um, <laughs> using go-tos, was well, that, um, <laughs> that really, like, how do you handle that, and, well, so the, and the that thing ended is, up actually being easy in the end? Well, the thing with go-tos being terrible is, like, if you if you can avoid it, you should, but, like, when you're writing really low-level stuff, you have to do it sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, like, how, does it end up being not that difficult to do in general? Um, well, so... Well, so it's it's very easy to write in Boogie. So is the question like, does Boogie have trouble verifying things about yeah. it? So well, for go to is like if you just if you abstract it correctly, like this is a function. The go to is actually just like it's calling that function, then it's mm -hmm. fine. So it really depends on how you encode it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, cool. So a uh, summary <coughs> of what was verified. Um, so the green stuff is what was verified. So there was an, a verified allocator and garbage cluster. Uh, the code to set up stacks and do stack context switching is verified. And then the, the interrupt tables and also the interface to the hardware devices is verified. And then all the hardware is trusted, the specification of the hardware and the memory bounds, that is trusted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an ex-device driver writer. That's so funny. It's so <laughs> funny. <laughs> well, you know, you can't do everything. Maybe it's a small subset. At least you can green. Yeah, I'm putting it in red. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you expect? Um, and then the interface specification, which you were asking about, Bert, um, that is also trusted until, I guess, apparently they, well, they did something with it that makes it less trusted now. <laughs> uh, what, what exactly do you mean by a verified garbage connection? Like, what does that imply? Um, so the garbage collector was uh, implemented in a similar manner to how I described. And so they had properties about what it meant for the garbage collector to maintain the well-formedness of memory. Mm -hmm. And then they used Boogie to verify that the garbage collector was implemented to adhere to that. Okay. I'm actually interested in what you mean by trusted. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, so trusted means it's not verified. So okay. it's like axiomatized. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. So what verified Boogie? That is also a very good question. <laughs> uh, nothing verified Boogie. So Boogie is trusted. <laughs> but there are provers that will give you a proof that you can check against um, something else. Boogie doesn't do that. So it's trusted. Yeah. So the terms that you are in your verification are correct. Um, so that is also trusted. <laughs> so, so the so sorry? So basically the very minimal specification you gave a moment ago in Boogie was not simple. It might be able to verify by hand, but I would imagine that writing an entire low level kernel nucleus with all of those verifications, you have a lot of lines of, of this axiom status that like right. there are preconditions and post conditions. What verifies that your preconditions and post conditions are correct? Well, 
Well, so so the only thing that's trusted is the specification of the in assembly instructions. Those are the axioms. But everything else is um. So those preconditions and postconditions don't have to be correct, but they have to eventually uh, verify against the axioms and also the specification, the interface specification. And so if you have the wrong ones, that the verification won't go through. Okay. And so so. I guess like the takeaway point is that what is trusted is what's down here and what's up there, but everything in between is um, is verified according to boogie going through and applying various deduction rules. Yeah, but I mean, like, how, how do you know that you didn't have some like failure in your logic that happens to ver like, verify all the rules through? But it does the thing, not the thing that you implied. Didn't right. So the failures in the logic will be introduced down here and up there. Um, and so, yeah, if you, if you specify, so what I showed you about the keyboard, that, if you had a failure in your logic there, then the system wouldn't verify. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess, I guess there's nothing that's that, like, that you've introduced that validates this verification. Like, it, it does the thing that you wrote it to do, but it doesn't necessarily do the thing that you intend. Right, right, exactly. So the verification only verifies that um, your, your axioms and your, your axioms satisfy your specification, but nothing else. Other questions? When you have a bug in your axiom, does that like cascade? Do you, does it look oh, really yeah. like, <laughs> If you axiom and tie is false, then you can prove anything. <laughs> in in yeah. terms of like actual implementation costs, like when you came up with bugs in your specification, like was it really costly to fix or was it like, oh, we messed this up and then like the, the well, solver fixes, the helps you fix the rest? So sometimes what happens is like you actually can't verify what you you thought you could verify, and then it turns out to be a specification error. So that's like a very common thing that happens. Um, yeah, so to give some idea of the context, there has been a lot of other work that has verified more functional properties of operating systems. So around the time we did this work, there's this project SEL4. They um, are a verified version of the L4 microkernel. So SEL4 is implemented in C and assembly. They have like a very small amount of trusted assembly that they trust. And then their C code, they verify functional properties of that. And how they do that is very hard. Um, so they, they have a C implementation. They have a Haskell reference implementation that does the same thing as their C implementation. They prove equivalence of those two. And then they prove properties on top of the Haskell implementation. And that's pretty much what you have to do to get functional properties out of C programs. Um, there's also like really, if you're interested in this stuff, there's like really, really, really cool recent work on like verifying hypervisors. And there was this paper at um, Yale that recently came out where, um, so, so cool like tangent, they also use form logic, it's relevant guys, um, <laughs> is that um, before, to build up your entire verified system, you kind of had to verify the bottom and then verify the next thing on top of specific things to the bottom layer and then every layer um, couldn't really export like a fully abstract interface to the next layer, and so all verifications had to go all the way down. But there are these guys at Yale who um, figured out a way to define a logic that let you abstract over implementation details of each layer, and so you could just like export a specification for your hypervisor that was like independent of certain functional things of the implementation, which is very cool, and they also use for logic. So um, yeah, like the Yale Flint project or the Yale Flint group, if you're interested, look into that. Um, yeah, so now uh, to wrap up, uh, I, uh, since most people probably don't <laughs> verify um, software uh, all the time, I uh, thought about some ideas we can you know, apply to our everyday lives. And I asked some of my friends who also work on this stuff what they think. So this is a communal set of ideas to take home. Um, so the first thing is that you should uh, always think about correctness. Right? Like even if you're programming in Python and you have no types and you have no static guarantees, you can still write a specification for your program. And you know, like documentation generators like Sphinx do a really good job of asking you, like, what are you returning? What are your input types? And like, what does this program do? Right? And so even if there's nothing checking your specification, it really helps yourself and also anyone using your code later if you write down a specification and think about what what invariants, what guarantees your program should preserve. Right? Um, also, uh, it really helps to choose a language that helps you reason, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so what I mean by this is, um, if your language gives you type safety and memory safety guarantees, you are not worrying about if you have dangling pointers, for instance. 
Um, and also, if your language has types, you're not worrying about something. So like a bug I always have in Python is I forget my return statement, like a bunch of stuff breaks and like, you know, a bunch of minutes later, it's like, oh, I forgot the return, right? If you have a language that checks your types, that doesn't happen. Um, and so it just reduces a lot of cognitive load. And so if you can, you know, using a language like that will start you off at a higher place of reasoning. So when you say types, you mean statically types? Yeah, statically types, yeah. Because there are dynamically typed Yeah, so strongly statically typed languages really give you a boost. Well, what if you're using a dynamic language with static type checker? That would also help. Yeah. So like any anything that, that can check your program before you run it really helps. Um, also, you know, <laughs> reading papers really helps. So I've been talking to some people who they're not academics, but they you know read ideas from academic papers and they build systems. And so, like, how many of you have heard of the Meteor system? Right. So it's this like reactive JavaScript web framework that was based on the Luna system that was built at Asana, which is actually based on this functional reactive programming paper um, based on this system called Flapjack that came out of academia like a bunch of years ago. And so a funny story about that paper, or a fun story, is that um, the professor, so um, it was like an undergrad paper, and the professor was like, this is not useful, I don't really even want to publish this, and it ended up having all this impact. Um, and it had all this impact because, like, first of all, the kid published it, but secondly, um, someone picked it up and said, this is really interesting, I want to build it for my company, and then I want to quit my company to build it for real, right? And so, so, you know, like some things have to happen, but reading papers is a good start. Um, also, um, you know, play with research tools. I think um, a lot of people learn Haskell not because they want to build systems in Haskell, but because it trains you to program in a way that um, makes you a better programmer in other languages. If you end up making your own language, you learn certain concepts, you get a feel for what certain language features can do for you. And so uh, relevant to CoreLogic are these tools. So um, Z3 is an automated prover. It's pretty much what a lot of automated tools compile down to. So they will compile down to Z3 constraints. Um, and so, so hmm, yeah, I guess what I should say is Z3 is a constraint solver. You can give it constraints about numbers, about uh, <coughs> lists, functions, I think it, mm, yeah, objects and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, it will solve constraints for you. Um, and so Boogie compiles to Z3 constraints and uses Z3 as its constraint solving backend, and so does Daphne, which is a uh, core logic prover for object-oriented programs. Um, and Boogie, and maybe even Daphne have like online uh, interfaces to play with them, so I really suggest doing that. There's also, um, if you want to put a lot more work in, things like Cock and Isabel. These are interactive theorem provers, which means that instead of you writing preconditions and postconditions and having it verify, you write something you want to prove, and then you guide the prover through a bunch of steps, like, okay, you break this into these cases, and then um, you know, this is what you do in this case, you apply this deduction rule in this case, etc. Some people really like it, they say it's like playing StarCraft. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you might like it. Um, yeah, so also um, be patient with research. Um, if you're using a research tool, it probably won't work a lot of the time, um, but the point of it is not to work all the time, it's to work sometimes and eventually lead to things that do work. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, now we uh, get to the pop quiz part of the talk, so that um, you can tell me what was talked about. So, what main issues did this paper address? Ryan Gosling. Yeah, that was a really big issue. Correctness. Correctness, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, provable correctness, right? So how do we express things to be provably correct and then how do we prove them, right? Um, why do we want to prove programs correct? Save lives. Save lives, yeah, otherwise we could die, right? Uh, so yeah, what were horror specific contributions to software verification? Triple robotics. Yeah, the triple. Um, and also, what should we be doing when we leave? <laughs> after that? Take the stairs. Groups and programmings. Yeah, after taking the stairs and programming? Yeah, programming has goals. Yes. What? Yeah, okay, so a big problem is translating from your uh, uh, your, your proof to a real program. There's a programming language called ATS that has a built in proof assistant. Okay. Cool. So you can go beyond. Nice. It's a difficult language to get up to. Cool. Yeah. Process between ML and C. Nice. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, there's also, um, if you guys want to know the new cool things in that's not Haskell, it's actually Indrus. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. a dependently typed language that um, is more obscure than Haskell. Um, <laughs> you have types that depend on terms. It's really wild. Um, I haven't even learned it yet. What language? Uh, Idris. I-D-R-I-S. It has yes. um, types that depend on term, dependent types, so you can like have like very strong guarantees about your program. Yeah, I haven't even learned it yet, so that's how cool that is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move all your programs into the type system, and then they're actually writing programs. Yeah. <laughs> Just write types all day. Just write types. Yeah. 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 So, um, so cool. Now that we all know what to do after, we can finish. Um, Here's a very cool retro picture of uh, Tony Hawk back then and now, so you can see how people change. Um, <laughs> so yeah, in this talk, we have defined a way to characterize programs and properties. So Hor was instrum instrumental in defining that. And since then, people have built tools to automatically and also interactively check programs and their properties. And then um, you know some people can drop it. <laughs> so yes. So um, I just want to make a comment about program correctness. Um, I'm a huge fan of Haskell, um, but I'm actually a little shy. Um, so people often talk about program correctness, but in Haskell, for example, there's no way of really modeling program intention. So yeah. I could write a program a function called add that takes two integers, performs a subtraction, and returns an integer, and Haskell would tell me if that program is correct. Hmm. Or anybody looking at that program is like, I know it's not correct. That's right. why you have Haskell add. quick check. Yeah, so there's kind of like, what I like about Idris actually is that Idris is actually moving in a direction where you can start to specify constraints so that you can actually start to specify program intention. Right, right. But I just, I don't like the word, um, people use the word correctness in, in a way that's not, that's a little too broad. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, people, I think people should qualify it more because, because correctness, if, if your program doesn't do what you intend it to do, it really doesn't matter if it's type checked, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a step. I think that, right? Yeah. If you're like, I don't know, doing things with strings instead of doing things with integers that's even further away. Yeah. Yeah. So every time I read about uh, proof solvers or uh, see presentations like this, the example is always basic arithmetic. I right? can prove that you can sum up the things in an array. Yeah. But I actually want to do more complicated things in my programs. How I can. I have trouble seeing how you make that leap from asserting that x plus 1 is greater than x to showing that the result of a random number generator is a uniform distribution of random num numbers. So if, if you want to do that, you also need probability in your prover. Um, so I mean, there are provers that do that. So there's this thing called um, probabilistic relational f star. But, um, but I mean, a lot of these solvers, they only have, they don't have theories, like those deep theories of numbers built in. And they just have linear uh, integer arithmetic. And then, um, uh, so, so essentially, like all the things that you want to do are, have to be built up of that. And so a lot of, so I guess there are like different classes of properties of what you can prove about programs. And so a lot of basic correctness properties are just based on linear arithmetic. Like memory well-formedness is just like, you like do some memory operations and those are just numbers. There's no like probability distribution in that, right? But if you're doing random number generation with like probabilistic stuff and all that, like you do need like a, a theory of like probabilistic numbers for that. That's like another layer. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think, well, it sounds like you're saying it's hard to prove higher level properties. Well, I guess what I'm saying is like the basic level, like what most, what most verified software is verified off of right now is not that. It's just like the linear arithmetic that, that is built up off of the small examples that are presented. And then like if you want to do that, like there's like a whole other like there's whole other theories of like how you prove that. And that's like uh, the next level. And so I guess it comes back to what, what this gentleman was saying is that it, it will prove you may be able to prove that my algorithm is implemented correctly, but you can't prove that my algorithm is correct. <coughs> well I mean there's it's really, really hard to model. If, 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 yeah. if your program isn't doing program. what you tell it to do, I guarantee it's not doing what you want it to do. So there's sort of the, if your program is not doing what you what you tell it to do, 
I can guarantee it's not doing what you want it to do, what you need it to do. Well, if it is, it's completely um, Yeah. So there, there's sort of there's multiple levels of yeah. correctness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, that, you but know, that's still there, orthogonal to what we're you know, discussing. The, the, what the we're discussing is whether or not programs can be actually correct. So it's a question of abstraction, really. And well, what I'm trying to say is that if you have a higher level problem and you want to verify that it is correct, what you need to do is prove that all of the various things that you're building that higher level problem with are correct themselves. So write llamas, you, like, you're like a cock will do. Uh, you write you know, an interactive uh, proof of all the various building blocks that you're doing, you verify those, and then you can then imply through deductive reasoning that, that your higher level program is correct. It's difficult to explain in a presentation, but. So there are also like different dimensions of correctness, right? So for every, so you have different theories, and so like what I mean by theory is there are a set of rules defined in, in a world. Um, so there, there's like, something <laughs> <laughs> is happening. Um, yeah, so, so essentially like you have these different uh, closed <coughs> worlds in which you can verify different things, right? And so in the world where you just have integers and you have, or like, integers and floating point numbers are you know, some model of them, and then like linear operations over those, you can verify a certain set of things. And so the property that you are describing, you can't verify in that world. You, have, you need like this other world that has like this notion of probability to model that. And so that, like, so that's the, so if you go to a presentation that's like the, the next, next, next level presentation, where they're talking about like theories of, for verifying that, they will talk about that, but it's not, it's in a different, different space of definition than the, the basic stuff. Yeah. So a lot of the things that we've been talking about are trying to prove positive qualities, uh, but uh, one interesting application of this is using constraint solvers like SPP to find exploits for binaries. Yeah. There's a, an interesting paper that came out a few years ago from uh, Carnegie Mellon called uh, Automatic Exploit Generation. That if you're curious about that, I suggest you check out. Thanks. Yeah. Um, in terms of the you know this state of the art for for provers, mm -hmm. uh, have any of them been applied to proving correctness of concurrent systems? Yeah. So um, there's some work on that. I don't know the work very well, but um, I think there's a there's at least one project that I know of. It's called Chalice at Microsoft Research, where. Um, they are trying to develop a logic for proving the correctness of concurrent systems. But um, concurrent systems are one place where you really, uh, proving it correct is a really good idea because you can't express all the possible in interleavings and it's really, really hard to test, if not impossible. And so there has been a bunch of work in that space. Yeah, I just, I can't point out other specific things. Yeah, let's take a look at uh, Peter Alvaro's thing called Molly that the paper's coming out soon. And that's like a system that includes like specs and programs to test the true of system. But I mean, that, that this kind of illustrates like the point is that it's not necessarily hard to prove some of these higher order things like concurrency or probability or necessarily the proving probably runs along very similar rails to what simple arithmetic proving does. The hard thing is actually just modeling the, the stuff that you're working with. Like integer arithmetic is easy because you have like, you know, like, you know, you use something like finite like P and O representation or something where you have all these easy like inductive things you can just get from it. But when you're talking about like, you know, something like concurrent system or whatever, what are your atoms? You yeah. Know, that's that's where all Yeah, well also modeling it in a way that you can actually verify Same. properties automatically. Right. Yeah. So a good book if you're interested in like actually playing with this is software foundations by Ben mm -hmm. And you get to basically just like run through a bunch of hot code and fill in the proofs yourself and write the proofs and prove more complicated 